reason, every time I think about the countdown, it starts at T minus seven seconds. I don't know why. Seven. Six. On behalf of the uh, Expedition 70 crew, I'd like to welcome uh, Axiom 3 on board the International Space Station. Welcome aboard Axiom 3, station we are now resuming operational audio communications. I am very proud of my AX3 crewmates who helped their agencies achieve all of their science objectives, technology demonstrations, as well as the outreach events. So what I really hope this experience as a family will uh, bring to them, it's the self-confidence that nothing is really impossible. I want to be an example and I want to be part of those that make something impossible possible. This is not a mission of a single individual. This is not magnifying a name. This is just the ignition moment. This is not the end. This is just the beginning. Hola, ciao, marhaba, and hello. From Axiom Space, I'm Alexis Dijarnet. I'm excited to be joined by the Axiom Mission 3 crew after their successful mission aboard the International Space Station. This talented and dedicated crew includes four individuals representing five nations. Starting with Commander Michael Lopez Aragria of the U.S. and Spain, MLA became the first astronaut to fly in SpaceX Dragon spacecraft for a second time. Then we have pilot Walter Villade of the Italian Air Force. For Walter, this mission has been a whole of country effort to expand Italy's access to space for the purposes of research, development, and innovation. Next is mission specialist Alper Gazlevauci, the first Turkish astronaut. The AX3 mission helped mark the 100th anniversary of the Republic of Turkey. And finally, mission specialist Marcus Swan of Sweden and the European Space Agency blazed a trail as the first ever ESA project astronaut. The AX3 crew launched on January 18th from Kennedy Space Center, spending 18 days aboard the International Space Station, conducting 54 research activities and facilitating 28 media outreach events before returning to Earth on February 9th. In total, they flew 9.1 million miles and orbited the Earth 346 times. In just a moment, we will hear from our commander for opening remarks. And after we hear from the rest of the crew, we will take questions from the media. If you'd like to ask a question, please raise your hand and submit your question to the moderator using the chat function in case of any technical issues. 
When called on, we ask for you to state your name, affiliation, and to whom your question is directed. So welcome home, AX3, and I'll now pass it over to Commander L.A. Thanks, Alexis. You did a great job uh, teeing up this conversation, and I really appreciate it. And welcome to all of the esteemed journalists from around the world. Uh, we really appreciate the interest that you're showing in this, what I think is a paradigm-shifting mission, um, which continues Axiom's efforts to expand access to low-Earth orbit. Uh, I want to start by thanking the agencies of my colleagues who put their trust in Axiom and their confidence in this new way of doing business to send humans to low Earth orbit. So first from Italy, the Italian Air Force and the Ministry of Defense and actually other ministries within the government. As Alexis said, it was a whole of government effort. In Turkey, Tubitak Uzay, which is the Space Technologies Research Institute, as well as the Turkish Space Agency and its minister, and of course, the Swedish National Space Agency, the government of Sweden, and ESA, who joined in this first ever effort to have an ESA astronaut fly on a commercial mission. So I want to do a quick recap um, of the mission. We launched on January 18th, as Alexis said, aboard the Freedom uh, spacecraft uh, after a one-day delay. The countdown was very smooth. Uh, ascent was exhilarating, as always. Nine minutes later, we're in microgravity. We spent about 36 hours, uh, what we call phasing. So the, we always launch in the same orbital plane as a space station, but it could be right overhead or it could be on the other side of the world. And in our case, it was on the other side. So it took us a, a while to get to the ISS. Once we got there, as you heard, we spent 18 days. I will tell you, they were busy. Uh, we were greeted, welcomed uh, by the resident ISS crew who was very gracious with their hospitality and sharing their knowledge of how to live and work in that very unique environment. Had a little bit of a delay coming home because the weather is tough. Uh, January, you can imagine, is a, a not an easy month to launch in, um, but eventually we did a splashdown, as you saw in the video, with some very nice waters off of Daytona Beach. Spent a couple hours of the, on the recovery ship uh, and then a couple more hours uh, doing some science collection on, based on experiments that we had done. They wanted to get some data right after landing. Uh, flew back to Houston to be greeted by our families in, uh, in a lovely reunion, which is, um, seemed almost surreal to be reunited that quickly after a mission. So I want to tell you just a couple of fun facts. Um, while we were on board, 11 people, I heard eight different languages spoken. So when you think about the international flavor, which is a very much a hallmark of this mission, uh, I think no statistic tells it better than that. Also, these, these gentlemen are number 609, 610, and 611 in the, human, in the history of humanity to orbit the Earth, which is a pretty big milestone. And I'd like to add that they represent, uh, with nine new space flyers uh, that Axiom has christened more than any other company and more than any other space agency since we started flying private astronaut missions in 2022. So to sum up, I think the things that take away from this mission were, first of all, the uh, important research uh, in science and the technology demonstration that we did, uh, the furtherance of this idea of expanding access to low Earth orbit to more countries, more research institutions and researchers, and ultimately more people. But finally, I want to leave you with one thing, and that is the number of young people that were touched by these three gentlemen in their home countries. These are people who, until recently, might not have ever been able to dream about someday going to space or being involved in the endeavor of human spaceflight, and now, thanks to them, they can. So I look forward to taking your questions. In the meantime, let me turn it over to Freedom Pilot, Colonel Walter Villade of the Italian Air Force. Thank you, Mike. Uh, good morning, everyone. It's an honor and privilege to be here uh, today with all of you. Uh, this mission has been uh, a part of the national strategy in space, but uh, it's worthwhile for many reasons. Uh, we were supposed to fly in 2023. That was the centennial of the Italian Air Force. Uh, and then uh, we flew in 2024. That marks another important event uh, uh, for Italy. That is uh, the 60 years of uh, Italian space activities. And this long story started just uh, thanks to the cooperation with the uh, United States of America. So this proves how much important is uh, the 
international cooperation. Uh, during this mission, uh, we have done a uh, lot of uh, experiments. Uh, I'm very proud that the payloads uh, we brought uh, on board the ISS, they came from the scientific community, from the military community, and from the industrial community. That is one of the most important value for this mission. We really uh, tested and proved a new model of uh, trying to get together not only the institutions, uh, but also the scientific community, military community, and industrial community. And that proves that space can really be a new stage for expanding uh, the access to space. Uh, this is important not only for Italy, but uh, for uh, Europe as a whole, uh, but uh, for the entire international community. So I'm very proud that uh, with uh, my colleagues and uh, thanks uh, to this amazing mission no, we prove that we can really foster and support this international cooperation. Uh, we uh, reached out a lot of uh, uh, young people, so this is another uh, important uh, point to inspiring the young generations. So they are the future uh, astronauts, scientists uh, that will uh, bring us uh, to Moon and then to Mars. So this is another uh, important uh, milestone that we achieved. And uh, before handing over to my colleagues, I want to really thank uh, the Axiom uh, SpaceX NASA leadership, as long as uh, with the Italian Air Force leadership, uh, that made this uh, mission uh, possible. So this has been an honor as an Italian astronaut to fly with these uh, uh, colleagues. And uh, having said that and waiting for your uh, questions, uh, I want to hand over to my colleagues and friend, uh, Colonel Alper uh, Gizerauci. Thanks so much, Walter. Welcome, everybody, to our press conference. I'm very honored and privileged to be the first ever Turkish astronaut to go to the space. I represented Turkey on this historic mission and had a chance to play a role in advancing my country's space exploration initiatives. Extreme mission put a remarkable footprint in our rightful new Turkish centennial and carried the limits of the future generation streams deep into the space. It gave me a privileged opportunity to be able to represent and serve my country at the furthermost, most advanced scientific platform of the humanity. It was an opportunity of a lifetime to represent Turkey on this historic mission, playing a role in advancing my country's space exploration initiatives. This mission helped to unify the Turkish people and their shared identity as citizens of Republic of Turkey, providing hope for my nation that was devastated by a natural disaster last year in this month, but never gave up on the hopes and solidarity. A extreme mission was symbolic as Turkey reflected on changes and progress made in the past hundred years. It inspired a sense of national pride, commemorated the achievements of the past century and set a positive and ambitious tone, ambitious tone for the future tied to the space exploration. Today, we are rebuilding and have moved forward to explore what had not been possible until now, enabling economic development, advancements in education and technology, and Turkey's role on the global stage, which is now in space. We accomplished so much during AX3, but this is just the beginning. This mission and accomplishment was not a destination for us. It was just the beginning of a journey. We brought our nation's agricultural endeavors to low Earth orbit, tested an artificial intelligence system to combat over 70 types of diseases, and helped advance best practices for astronaut care as part of Turkey's rapidly developing uh, national space program. I would also like to express my deepest appreciation and sincere uh, gratefulness to my XTM3 team members, Commander MLA, Walter and Marcus for such an amazing harmony they have created and maintained throughout the preparation and the execution of the mission. Also, special thanks to all of our friends in Axiom Space who have supported us in every single step. This mission has been a wonderful experience thanks to them. Now it's time to look ahead, a vision for the future, Turkey in space based on our galactic goals for the next Turkish century. Now I would like to hand over the words to my dear friend, ESA astronaut, Lieutenant Colonel Marcus Wands from Sweden. Thank you, Alper. Uh, thanks a lot. Yeah, it's, uh, it's been a, a great experience to uh, join this crew and, uh, and uh, go to space. And I'm so proud of um, 
representing uh, Sweden and Europe and, and actually maybe humanity out, out there. As you heard mentioned earlier, not that many of us have been there yet. Uh, and I'm looking forward to a lot of more uh, people getting up to space. And this is one way of making that happen. So I'm very proud of uh, Sweden being decisive and together with the European Space Agency and Axiom, making it possible to increase the frequency and, and the presence uh, in space. And a little bit about the experience in space. Uh, so one of the one of the highlights uh, during, we, we did a lot up there, but one of the highlights was to talk to um, uh, to uh, uh, children on ground and students and and get all those fantastic questions, which are questions that I've had myself, and and to be able to to answer those questions and try out uh, then and there how how it worked if they asked a specific question, and, and just feeling that curiosity and that inspiration flow all the way from Earth uh, up into space. That was very that was a very big and strong feeling, and and all the science uh, and all the tech demos that we that we did and the range uh, that the wide range of different things we did that was also that was for uh, exploration of space but also for the benefit of earth makes makes me very proud to be a part of that and privileged to be a part of that um, and coming back to earth and meeting people and talking to them and and answering the small detailed questions about how how is it to to flow through the station how is it to make a turn how, how does it feel to sleep and and all those small operations and that big experience to bring that back and when you talk about it and you can see the interest just firing up and and how people wants to be a part of learning and and continue to do research and and just continue to move our boundaries is, is very strong and also to talk about how it is to watch like look at earth from space and space from space and try to communicate how that feels and and what perspective that gives is uh, is very very strong and uh, i would love to see that happen to a lot more and that's that makes me really proud to be a part of this and and see that sweden and europe and and globally we're moving forward uh, and to know more and to just expand our world which is which is great with that i'll hand it over to you alexis Thank you, Marcus, and thank you, AX3 crew. We'll now open the floor to reporter questions. If you have a question, please use the raise your hand feature and submit your questions in the chat. If you are joining on your phone, press star six to unmute yourself when called on. Also, please say your name, affiliation, and to whom you would like to direct your question. All right, so shall we begin? All right, we will start with Elizabeth Howell. Uh, this question is for Michael, and so I was listening to a NASA press conference recently over the weekend where they were saying that your long ride, your crew's long ride on Crew Dragon allowed them to collect, them and SpaceX, to collect a lot of information about how Dragon behaves with the crew on board. And so can you speak to that and also the experience of riding on a Dragon twice? Well, first of all, thanks for the question, it, Elizabeth. It, it's uh, obviously a privilege to ride on any spacecraft twice. Um, and Dragon was certainly no different. It's true, we had a long time. I mentioned the 36 hours, uh, as we say, uphill, so the time from launch to docking, and then we had 47 hours from undocking to splashdown. And those two uh, numbers combined end up being the longest presence on uh, Dragon of, of any crew so far. So, you know, you might ask, what are we doing up there? It's funny, we had just spent uh, 18 days aboard the space station doing all kinds of experiments and technology demonstrations, and yet there's still the wonder of being in space and microgravity and playing with food and uh, do, seeing what, how water um, in the bottles would react in microgravity. And of course, the view out the window never gets old. So I, I think, you know, the 47 hours, uh, I'll admit, was, seemed pretty long at the beginning. And then before you knew it, it was over and the parachutes opening and splashed down. Uh, wonderful experience. Um, I, I, I would uh, encourage anybody who would love to have, that exper or to have that experience to do so because it is truly unique and uh, a, a real opportunity once in a lifetime, twice sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, LA. All right, we now have Marsha Melly. Thanks to all of you for your time. I have a question for all of you. What was the most emotional moment you lived during this mission in space? Thanks. Start with Marcus. <laughs> yeah, uh, there were several several moments that would that was really emotional. Uh, but since you're asking for the most. Uh, uh, I've been, you know, reading and hearing about this overview effect uh, and uh, looking on Earth and uh, what that does to you uh, uh, as an astronaut or as a human being. And uh, 
I remember the first few days I looked outside and it looks it was beautiful and I, I it just felt surreal. But after about three or four uh, days, or yeah, four or five days maybe, it started to become all of a sudden actually it became emotional and became emotional when I floated down into the cupola and looked outside and for some reason I just got stuck there and, uh, and that was really that was really interesting I did not expect that uh, and I did not see that coming at that point but then that feeling stayed with me um, throughout the mission actually going down and looking looking outside and seeing space and earth at the same time and that thin atmosphere that was very strong does anyone else have anything they would like to add well, definitely, Marcus mentioned the cupola. One of the, the most emotional uh, moments was uh, over uh, during the first day in one of our 16 orbits. So we had the opportunity to fly over Italy through directly from the north to the south, and it was uh, night. So having the opportunity to really see Italy from space and uh, all the lights and all the different cities was uh, very, very emotional. And actually, it was one of the few days where it was a clear sky, pure and very easy to look at. And I would say that the second very emotional moment was the takeoff. As soon as the countdown now uh, went to zero, and of course, uh, we have been in training uh, for so long. So in our mind, we have a mental moment model, very precise or whatever is going to happen uh, in a second. But then I feel all the vibration and, and then lifting up, that was really emotional. So. Well, thank you. All right. Well, now we'll move on to Javier Gregory. Okay, Javier, um, I see the question, and I'm not sure if the folks online can see it. I'll repeat it. Um, Javier is a Spanish journalist from Spanish radio. would like to ask me how Spain is seen from space because suffering from a long drought and how it sees the return of the astronauts to the moon after the failure of the first lander sent to the South Pole by Japan and the United States. Uh, he would like the answer to be in Spanish. So let me answer it in English first. Um, interestingly, so I, I really focused on trying to uh, get some photography of Spain. And uh, as Walter mentioned, the weather wasn't great all the time, but we had some nice passes. And I, I remember from previous flights that I had said to folks that I could see the entire expanse of the Iberian Peninsula in, in one, basically just looking out the window. And that's definitely true. I have some pictures to prove it now. Interestingly, my sense was that it was greener than I remember it in previous times. Um, and I think, Javier, you may have asked me this very question on previous occasions, and uh, because it seems like Spain is in a drought quite often, um, but it seemed greener to me. Um, and, and a final comment on the moon landing, I think everybody is aware of the uh, Intuitive Machines Odysseus landing, which was successful uh, in the South Pole. And of course, a very important milestone toward uh, humans landing there in the not too distant future. Ahora en español, primero, Javier, un, un placer saludarte. Mira, eh, había dicho antes que podía ver toda la península ibérica en un, desde la ventana de la escotilla de la, de la estación. Y ahora puedo confirmar que es cierto que he tomado bastantes fotografías que han salido bastante bien. Y la impresión que tenía es que la península estaba más verde que antes. Y sé que me habías preguntado esta pregunta en otras ocasiones, de otras, después de otras misiones. Y mi impresión es que era más, uh, aunque haya sequía ahora, Igual había sequía antes, parece que España sufre mucho de, de sequía y estaba un poco más verde en esta ocasión. Y en cuanto a la luna, pues eh, todos sabemos que ha aterrizado en el polo sur uh, últimamente eh, la máquina, la, la nave de Intuitive Machines. Y yo creo que es un paso súper importante para la llegada de los humanos, los seres humanos, que de verdad estamos volviendo a la luna. Y eso es muy importante. Thank you, I'm Alan. finished. <laughs> Thank you. All right. We're now going to call on Jonathan Seri. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for doing this. Jonathan Seri with Fox News. And uh, really, any of the crew members could uh, answer this, anyone who wants to take this. As you contribute to the study of the effects of space flight on the human body, what would you say are the areas that need the most further study, the most unanswered questions? It's uh, it's difficult to say. Actually, now I I still wait, still waiting for uh, the results. It's we've been collecting the data, still doing scans. Uh, just came back from Europe uh, two days ago from uh, doing continuing that uh, baseline data collection as also specific collection for the data. 
so no answers yet from this mission specifically, but when it comes to the, the study of uh, the processes of how uh, a loss of bone mass and, and muscular power, I think we know uh, some of that when it comes to space or a lot of that when it comes to space exploration and how to do countermeasures and that also, but that, so that comes back, back a lot to medicine on Earth. But when it comes to effects of uh, radiation and, uh, and effects of uh, prolonged microgravity, that's where we, I think we need to learn uh, a lot more. And uh, a lot of things uh, that I've learned now is actually that we can cope with a lot more and we can actually countermeasure a lot more than I thought before entering this world and starting to learn about it. So it's, uh, it's great being a part of this, uh, of this process of building this uh, knowledge. Yeah, let me just um, pivot on that a little bit. I think, Marcus, you're right about the, having studied the bone and muscle loss. Um, obviously, there's a lot of conversation about the effect on vision through what's now called SANS. But I think what's interesting and what we did a lot of in this mission was um, studying things with an eye toward how they can affect humans on Earth, looking at uh, tumor organoids, looking at stem cells, looking at cognitive function. And I think those things, um, how those, especially stem cells and tumor organoids react in microgravity and how we can use the knowledge gained from that to help with therapeutics on the ground and maybe prevention someday. So I, I think it's interesting that we've been doing for many years now a lot of research on how to do longer duration flights in space, which continues to be very important, obviously, but also now uh, what we can do more and more to help humans on Earth. Yeah, and I want to tag along a little bit more there as well, because something that might not be obvious is that space uh, travel is a, a a tool where you get these uh, accelerated uh, reactions sometimes, where you can really study the things that that Mike talked about, for instance, uh, aging or how it affects our DNA. And you can get those that in a very controlled environment uh, just by going to space and back and then studying it before and after and learn a lot that we really can't learn uh, on Earth uh, because we remove those factors and make it very controlled and and um, uh, and accelerated. So it's it's really interesting to be a part of that. Yeah. Thank you. Um, we now have Ali Artmas. I would like to ask uh, to Alper Gezer Alje. Uh, thank you for all efforts. Uh, I am proud of you as all Turkish people. Uh, I am Ali Artmas for TRT News, TRT Haber, uh, Turkish Radio Television. I have a two question. One question. What was the big challenge uh, for you in this process, uh, physically or emotionally? And second question, do you have any regret? I mean, I could do something extra or I could prepare myself much better or do you have a thing that forget? For example, if you had a chance to do it again, what would you like to change? Ali Bey, hoş geldiniz. Uh, thank you so much for your comments and your thoughts. And I was really ha so happy within the last 10 days to see this reflection that you have already put into the words back in Turkey. Uh, it's, it was a great amount of excitement and really passion that people was people were reflecting upon to our hopes relating to this space related uh, endeavors that uh, we will be just stepping into as the country. <clears throat> in terms of challenge relating to your first question, I don't really uh, I can't really think of a moment as Axiom Space has really given us a lot of insights under the lead of our commander Michael Lopez Alegria during the whole preparation process. I felt like we were really uh, prepared so well mentally, physically and psychologically. So I didn't really feel any kind of uh, difficulty in any of the stages up in the, up in the orbit. Second, yes, I have a regret, unfortunately. I wish I had a chance in my previous career and uh, in my lifetime to get the chance to be able to learn one more language, which is Russian in this case. I will definitely um, encourage our future nations, future generations to learn not only a single, but at least two uh, foreign languages for our uh, future attempts in this space-related business. Thank you so much for your question again. Thank you, Alper. We now have a question online from Matthew Kilbasa. So I'm gonna go ahead and read it for all four of you. Can you elaborate on the current efforts and future developments in integrating such medical wearables capabilities into astronaut spacesuits or daily routines? And how can they contribute to proactive healthcare management during long duration missions? 
Ole, we'll begin with you. Sure. I mean, I think um, the wearable um, wave is definitely upon us, and we've taken a lot of steps to humans on Earth, I mean, to wear everything. And I'll throw out some names, Fitbit, Whoop, Aura, there's Apple Watch, there's all kinds of um, opportunities. And I think it's a wonderful tool to be able to kind of assess objectively how your body's doing and what your routine is, uh, how it's affecting it. Um, we did fly some wearables on orbit. Uh, first, I think it's more from a curiosity, self-satisfaction standpoint to take those same measurements and, and have the same analysis of what your body is and how much rest you're getting. You know, we don't do a lot of exercise in a short duration mission, um, probably not as much as we would like on Earth. Is, is that a factor? Um, maybe tease out the effects of microgravity. It's a little hard to tell. But I think in the future, because it's so easy to just have it on and, and not even think about it, I think there's a lot of data that could be mined there. There you guys. And uh, yeah, yeah. If I may add, we had uh, an experiment uh, called uh, uh, Smart Flight Suit Two because the first version we flew with the Virgin Galactic, and actually it was an interesting concept. It's not just a matter of uh, collecting data, which is always useful because you can uh, uh, monitor the the status of the astronauts as well as other can very specific population fighter pilots or or other professional that are uh, normally taking some activities in in. A harsh environment but it's also a matter of uh, developing new fabrics so the point uh, made uh, by this uh, small startup was trying to look at the new fabrics are uh, capable to collect directly some of these experiments some of this data so it's a matter of uh, putting together uh, a kind of easy concept so how to monitor the, the, the population and of course the more the population is getting old and the more this kind of uh, um, devices are useful to really monitor uh, each of us but then it's it, it's also a matter of uh, getting on the table new uh, fabrics new technologies uh, for instance uh, one of the fabrics they were developing was trying to have uh, some uh, t-shirt for normal uh, workout so when you can uh, sweat you can just simply hang out on the air and dry out the t-shirt without washing out and if you think also the impact in terms of sustainability even on the ground some of these technologies can really have a much wider applications not only for astronauts wonderful thank you so much all right we're now going to call on per olive saner and he actually dropped his question in the chat so i'll go ahead and read it and this one's for out there both members of Turkey's astronaut corps will have flown during 2024. Is it likely that astronauts from Turkey will fly again in the next few years? And if so, are there any details that you can share? Thanks so much. This is also a very good question. Um, as soon as I arrived in Turkey, within our very first day, we had, an, we had a meeting with the Minister of Industry and Technology relating to future plans of our space-related endeavors and attempts so strong decisions have already been taken we are already looking for further and future plans for the turkish youth generations including us uh, to carry out any other following space uh, journeys space missions which will be contributing for the sustainability of our initial attempt and stepped into the space Thank you. All right, now we have a question for Marcus from Marcus Peterson. <laughs> um, so how will the cooperation between LA, Walter, Alper, and you continue now after this mission to space? Will this lead to more collaborations between our countries in the future? Thanks, Marcus. That's a, that's a great question. Uh, right now, we're reconvening here, which feels great. Uh, so we can start talking again about our experiences and what we thought was uh, good and what we can develop and uh, and how this was a way to uh, for our countries and our organizations and agencies to uh, to go further and I'm I'm confident that we will have contact in the future and and continue to be a part of developing this and and moving the boundaries even further and uh, and uh, just seeing the different ways uh, that our agencies and countries and companies have. Uh, uh, boldly made a difference or changed how to do things, how to achieve this access have been very, very motivating and inspiring for us. Um, I'm expecting us to keep that contact and uh, keep discussing that in the future as well. Great. Thank you. All right. And this one's for Walter. 
What aspects on this mission do you think will inspire Italy, especially young Italians interested in going to space? Well, that is, uh, it's, it's a very important to vehiculate and to communicate the young generation that space is not only a dream. It's not only a dream for a few people and a few astronauts that have the privilege to fly to space, but actually is uh, for all of them uh, really a concrete opportunity that they can uh, pursue studying and, of course, uh, getting a lot of effort in uh, building up uh, their uh, their background, their uh, professional uh, choices. So uh, even during these uh, few days after the mission, uh, I've been in Italy and talking with uh, uh, many young people. And the main point is to see how much they are really inspired by the possibility of just uh, flying to space. And the other point, the very important, is that just astronauts are the tip of the iceberg. So there are so many other uh, professionals that uh, make uh, the flights possible, from doctors to engineers. We are uh, in an environment today in, uh, in Axiom full of engineers are building up at the new space station. So there's really a big opportunity and this is a fundamental uh, uh, not only for keep flying in the Leo Earth orbit, but also if we want to fly farther to the moon and then to Mars. So we need a new generation of new brilliant uh, scientists uh, capable to address and, uh, and sort it out some of the problems that um, still need to be addressed. So the main point is really to use this opportunity to talk to the young generation and to inspire them. And actually they inspire us as well with their questions, with their, uh, uh, with their uh, actually enthusiasm. It's, it's like of a twofold uh, inspirational uh, approach. Great, thank you so much. And this one's for Albert. As the first Turkish astronaut to launch into space, what does this historic milestone mean to you personally and for your country? I'm focusing more into the um, impact and the really symbolic meaning uh, for the country. It is, I don't want to focus it to an individual um, accomplishment that's really reflecting um, a big accomplishment reflecting upon the whole nation, especially after such a devastating uh, natural disaster that we experienced last year. It's really contributed to bring the people all together and we have already seen the impact and the emotional effect on the whole uh, nation over there. And that was also a remarkable moment that I would like to mention over here. Last year on the 29th of April, um, when we were announced publicly by our uh, president uh, to the whole uh, Turkey, at the stage while coming eye to eye with the people, I was really seeing that clear message from the eyes of the people. They were not only looking a single individual over there at the stage, but they were really uh, reflecting the feeling of an individual a child from their family was there at the stage. So this is a mission which is incorporating the common will, the total will of the whole nation. So that is important in that manner. Uh, this one's for Marcus. Uh, can you describe a moment during the mission that you feel exemplifies the spirit of ex exploration and discovery for Sweden and Europe? That that symbolizes or say that again? Like, exemplifies. Exemplifies. The spirit of exploration. Uh, yeah, one, there were several moments. Uh, so uh, first we did some uh, science that was uh, directly from, uh, from Sweden and it was uh, involving uh, uh, how, um, how stem cells are affected and how you can use microgravity for that. And then we also did cognitive experiments and some to find, to find a new environment or use microgravity, for instance, to to uh, find new ways of doing things or utilizing things, that's innovation. And innovation has been a very strong thing in Sweden for a long time, and it's a knowledge-based, uh, innovative uh, country in general. So every time we did something a little bit different, actually throughout the whole process of uh, making this mission happen, I could feel the presence of uh, an innovative country that wanted to do things in new ways and, and finding new uh, partnerships to do that with and, and just uh, making that happen. That's That's been very strong with me throughout the whole mission. Great. Thank you so much. All right. Well, that's all we have time for today. Thank you, MLA, Walter, Alper, and Marcus, and congratulations on your successful mission to the International Space Station. While the flight operations for AX3 have came to a close, the research efforts and the opportunities to inspire the world will continue well into the future. 
For any follow-up questions on the AX3 mission, you can send them to media at axiomspace.com. And with that, we'll sign off saying adios, ciao, hoshtika, and hado.